Namaste, hello, and welcome to NCPCR's webinar. Today's topic is really, really interesting. But before I tell you about the topic and our fantastic guest, I give it to the chairman, Mr. Priyank Kanungu, to start us off. Today, this is a very interesting topic. We have a lot of Honorable Justice Shri Deepak Gupta Ji, who will talk about institutional care as a last resort. और हम सभी को पता है कि सर का ये कितना चहेता विषय रहा है और सर ने सर्विस में अपने रहते हुए ऐसे अनेक प्रयास किए कि बच्चे डीइंस्टिट्यूशनलाइज हो पाए बच्चे घरों में जा पाए बच्चे फोस्टर केयर में जा पाए बच्चों को स्पॉन्सरशिप के फायदे मिल पाए आज हम सर से ही जानेंगे कि आगे उनके द्वारा शुरू किए गए इस काम को हम सभी लोग कैसे आगे बढ़ा सकते हैं मेरे साथ यहाँ रूपाली बनर्जी जी हैं कमीशन की मेम्बर सेक्रेटरी हम पूरे कमीशन की तरफ से सर आपका बहुत स्वागत करते हैं आपका बहुत आभार राइट थैंक यू सो मच सो एज आई सेड बिफोर Namaste, hello, and welcome to today's webinar, today's session from the NCPCR. My name is Priyanka Deo. I'm a YouTuber from channel New India Junction. I'll be anchoring today's session. It's a really interesting session. The topic is institutionalization being the last resort and looking towards alternative care. Now, before we begin, I'd like to, of course, introduce our fantastic guest, Justice Deepak Gupta. Justice Gupta, namaste, and thank you. Welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you for giving us your time. Now, you're very recently retired, right? So I'd just like to tell the audience, he's just very recently retired. He served over four decades. That's over 40 years in the profession. So Justice Gupta, uh, you're very well known. I'd just like to actually give you the floor and uh, have you introduce us to uh, our audience today. Uh, should I take on? Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm not going to talk about myself. That uh, not uh, don't expect me to do that. But I'll uh, talk about the topic. You know, I'm very passionate about this thing about deinstitutionalization. Till a few years back, I also felt that the only way to take care of juveniles, either in conflict with law or children in need of care and protection was to put them in homes and to run the homes well. As you know, homes, not all homes run well. In fact, a large number of the homes are not run very well. And we have had big problems. I'm not going to go into that aspect today in a greater detail because I thought we'll be having more speakers and it'll be more interactive. But anyway, since I have to speak now, I suppose for about half an hour, so like we, have, to... uh, we have lots of questions for you, but just so before we uh, begin yeah. and before you start talking. Or you can ask topic, me some questions, then I can answer them. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's uh, that's what I'm here for. So before we begin, uh, can you tell us um, a little bit about, uh, let's back up one step. Uh, let's talk about uh, the institutionalization ka definition kya hai for those that are, main, that are not so well versed. And uh, what is the lay of the land in India right now on institutionalization? Uh, as you know, uh, Priyanka, uh, and the, most of the audience would be knowing that, uh, because I expect that those who are watching this program are interested in children and the welfare of children. So we governed by the Juvenile Justice Act. And it has various types of homes, homes for children, homes for newly born children, homes, shelter homes and homes for even children in conflict with law, homes for more grown up people. So there are different types of homes contemplated under the act. But the act also contemplates that we must try and deinstitutionalize and see that alternative systems of looking after these children are there. See, why do children get into trouble? Before we look at the problem, we must look at the cause. And in my view, one of the biggest causes in India is just sheer poverty. When people are very poor and they have a second, third or fourth child, then they try and dump that child in some institution. They leave that child in an institution. So I think, first of all, at the lowest grassroots level, 
whether it be the villages or in the urban slums, etc. An effort should be made, one, at family planning, that have only that many children that you can afford. And uh, you see, you have to look at the causes. First, you have to limit the number of children. Secondly, when you limit the number of children, there will be fewer coming to home and fewer will be in conflict with them. Then the second aspect is give them some sort of counseling, even at the level, at that level, that can you afford such a, such a child. You know, now abortion, even till 24th week is permitted, whether somebody likes it or not, it's a uh, personal. But if you can't afford a child, to bring the child into the world and then abandon it is even worse than having an abortion. Then let's assume that a ch child is born and the parents don't want it. That's sorry. Before I come to that, then the other cause is where the mother is abandoned by the husband. One is poverty itself. One is where the mother is abandoned by the uh, husband. That's another big cause. Uh, can you want to say something? Priyanka, you want to say something? No. Okay. No, continue. Uh, uh, so that's another big cause is that, you know, abandoned uh, uh, mothers, they feel that they can't look after children and they then abandon the children. Then there are others who lose their parents, one parent or two parents. There are some who lose one parent. Supposing the mother dies, the father gets remarried. Like in Indian society, for a woman to get remarried is much more difficult, but for a man to get remarried is much easier. Then when he gets remarried, the tendency many times is that the children of the first from the first wife are sent to some home. So these are the various types of children which will come. One is the counseling which I dealt with. Secondly, why should children be sent into institutions? What are institutions? These are institutions either run by the government or by NGOs. And they provide basic needs of the children. They look to ensure that the children, if the act is followed, and I'm assuming for the sake of this program that all the homes are run very well in accordance with the Juvenile Justice Act, which I voted. Now, the Juvenile Justice Act lays down various criteria. Let's assume they run according to this criteria, which unfortunately they are not. There is still one factor missing. And that factor is love and affection. No institution, howsoever good, can provide love and affection to a child. That family bond will always be missing. Now what happens is, in a case like this, I have been advocating for the last two, three years, and I must say it's not my idea. It was when I met people from UNICEF and when I made a, met a lady called Dalia Pop, Dr. Dalia Pop from Romania. Because I'll be telling you about my Romania experience a lot. I'll be speaking about that. So they brought this, and I suddenly realized that we I myself was following, I mean, not the wrong path, but had not looked at the really important role of alternative care. So what is alternative care? Alternative care is to give the child. So Justice Gupta, before yeah. uh, we get to uh, alternative care, now when we talk about institutionalization, just so that our audience gets a little bit of an idea, uh, as you said, it's not very even across the country. Now I have traveled as a journalist, I've traveled to the Northeast, uh, for example, in fact, with uh, NC on behalf of NCPCR. Uh, and I've also traveled across country, uh, the country. So uh, between major metros, tier two, tier three, rural India, what do you see in the in the difference of institutionalization? Is it very uneven, uh, or do you see better care perhaps in major metros versus rural India? What what has been your experience in in what you've uh, dealt with so far? Uh, I think uh, it varies differently from state to state. It varies from institution to institution. It varies, you know, it just matter who is heading the institution. If that lady or the man, gentleman who's in charge of the institution has that empathy in him has, for the children, that that institution with the same funds which are provided to the other institution runs in a much better manner. 
I'll tell you a story now that since we've talked on this topic, many years back, I was uh, driving from Simla. I was going to a place called Palampur. And with me was Justice Sanjay Karol, who is now Chief Justice of the Patna High Court. So he used to look after juvenile justice in the High Court. So he said, there's a home in the way. So let's drop in there. I don't like giving very surprise visits. You know, we are not inspectors or something. But we give a short notice. We give a notice about two, three hours that we are coming. We went to that home. I'm not joking. It was one of the cleanest homes I've seen. It had... The kitchen was cleaner than my kitchen is. And that couldn't have been done in two hours notice. That couldn't have been done at two hours notice. I found, so I asked that lady that how do you manage so well? The children looked happy. Because, you know, the, for me, the measure of an institution is do the children look happy or not? So the children looked happy. I talked to the children, both, both brother Sanjay and I talked to the children. And they were like, you know, all over and very friendly. I have a photograph with all of them. And then I asked that lady, do you need anything? She said, no, we have everything. We have everything. I asked her once or twice. So she said, no. But as I was leaving, she said, the children have asked me to make a request. So I said, what? So the children say that when will we get, you know, like sports shoes? Like, you know, like all other children wear shoes and track pants to wear. You know, they were, they had everything. They were not complaining about the food, about anything. But what a little thing that when they went to in Himachal, a flat place is called a Chugan, a playground sort of, it's a huge playground. So they said, they, then when I talked to the children, they said, Hum jab chugan mein jate hai, to paas to wohi chappal, kurta, pajama hota, aur baki bachche sare track suit aur wo pen ke. You know, this was such, it's not, nobody had thought about it. And it set me thinking. I have a cousin who's a very famous eye surgeon there. I just mentioned in the evening while sitting with him and having dinner and a drink. We, I told him this is what had happened. Two days later, the lady rang up. The doctor so-and-so had come and his wife had come and they fitted all my children with lovely sports gear, etc. See, the idea is twofold. One is... It's not only to fulfill the basic needs of food. It's also their desires. You and I, I don't know if you're married, but I have two daughters. If you have children, they want to go out, you know, have a chocolate once in a while, have an ice cream once in a while. How do you meet that need? There's a home in Bombay, which I can tell you is one of the best run homes. Probably the children are not, look, uh, not looked after better than that than any other home, one of, must, must be one of the best home homes. But I was told by uh, the head of UNICEF in India that when she went there, the children complained that for three years they had not been outside the home. So you are keeping them in a confinement. And why was the, if the NGO said we can't take them out because of the restrictions played by the act and the, you know, everybody is worried ki, agar ek bachcha gum ho gaya, to hum kya, kis ko jawab dege, hum outing pe leke jayen, koi ge, so they keep them in the home. Now we have to, now the answer is not institutionalized. Institutions can be well run. I'm not, some institutions have it. But then the other question, part of your question is, are you, is, are there different standards all over the country? Very, uh, very much so. Some so states, let's talk about uh, some of the uh, perhaps <laughs> uh, lesser, lesser fortunate uh, children, I don't want to use that term, but I was just coming yeah. to that. See, luckily, sure. luckily, I was Chief Justice first in uh, Judge in Himachal, then Chief Justice of Tripura. Both these states are basically honest states, and uh, the level of empathy is more. So, I found the homes run in these states were much better by and large much better. The children were much happier. In but When you go to bigger states, when you go to bigger states, the number of children becomes much more. When you look at the 10-15 children in any home, the staff will manage to manage it easily. But when you have 50 or 60 children or 100 then it becomes very difficult to manage. And in states like Bihar, Chhattisgarh, UP, etc., 
the crunch on the staff is so much the government doesn't provide funds enough so there are two not two there are about four or five different standards of institutions some very well run some Correct. well run yeah and that's that's logical uh, so now uh, let's talk about uh, what rights uh, children have <laughs> Uh, according to the act, I know you showed the, the act, the bear act uh, a little while ago, but uh, when a child is placed in the institution, what rights do they have that perhaps they're not aware of? Now, I, I don't even think the parents or, you know, if, if the parent wants to, um, uh, if they don't want the child, as you said, uh, or if circumstances uh, are uh, not letting them keep the child, I don't even think the parents are or adults are aware of uh, what rights they have and it's lesser known as to what rights children have so once they are placed in an institution what rights do uh, do these children have or what rights does a child have see let me tell you that article 21 which are the sorry the fundamental rights under our constitution are guaranteed to every citizen and a child from the day he or she is born is a citizen of the country and therefore she or she has this right, every right which each one of us has. And that includes the right to live with dignity. Because Article 21 has been read to mean that the right to life is just not a meaning, meaningless existence. It has to be something more than that. Now, what the Act gives is provisions. Every child will have two sets of clothes or three sets of clothes, one winter set of clothes, two bed sheets, khana is type ka milega. I'm not worried about that. A child also has rights as a citizen of the country. Now, every child, according to me, has a right to live with his or her parents. It's the right of every child to have the love and affection of each parent. It's, it's the child's right. And he should have the right to claim it from the parents. Every child has a right to live to speak the language of his parents. Every right has a every child has a right to grow up in the environment in which he is born. Every child has a right to eat the food which his parents give him. This is the basic rights. No, I'm not talking about freedom rights of right of free speech, etc., that will come up when they grow up. I'm talking about the right because they are the voiceless. Children are the voiceless people. And when they are the voiceless people, who has to speak up for them? It is people like you and I who will speak up for the children. And that can only be done on by two ways. Like when you, on behalf of NCPCR, visited the institutions, you mean it must have seen good institutions, you must have seen bad institutions. So you highlight both. My request to journalists is not only to highlight the bad institutions, but also to highlight some of the good ones. To set an example that these are the good ones which uh, do a good job. But when I talk about alternative care, that is why I say the right of the child usko apne mahal mein jine ka haq hai. Us bachche ko apne maabab ki zubaan bhoonne ka haq hai. Us bachche ko jo uska rehen sehen hai, jo uska khana peena hai. Hum us bachche ko utha ke, like in the northeast you must have seen, I don't know. Children have been picked up from the northeast, sent to either Kerala or Jammu or Rajasthan. Now why should that child be taken outside the Northeast and taken to other states? Does that child not have a right to learn, live in the atmosphere of the Northeast, which is a very beautiful atmosphere? I have served as Chief Justice in three and a half years in the Northeast, and I tell you, I fell in love with that place. So, why that is my main grievance that before you institutionalize, institutionalization should be the last resort. First resort should be to somehow see that the child is kept in the atmosphere, in the environment in which the child is born. If that doesn't turn to be fruitful, then we send the child somewhere else. So before we get to, sorry, one more question before we get to- No, no, no as many care. questions, as many uh, questions. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, perhaps if you could share with the audience based on your experiences and what you've seen, uh, what are the impacts uh, uh, that befall these children when you know as you said before when they are sent from one state to another state when they do not receive this love and affection from these institutions uh, perhaps you know in an institution that is very well run 
but they don't want to take the risks or go against the act in any way or be accountable in any way so they don't send the children outside so what impacts have you seen powerful impacts perhaps in your experience in the courtrooms what impacts have you seen that uh, affect these children how do they get affected they get affected in many 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 ways you see they a psychological effect on them there's no study empirical study done till date as far as i know on a large uh, sample of children but my strong view is that when uh, the children don't be, be, uh, get love and affection then it has a great mental impact on their psyche because love and affection is also necessary for the growth of any human being today we are in covid times sitting at home some of us in great comfort but we miss a sibling if they are living in some other station if your mother father brother sister is stuck alone in one station or is in quarantining for 14 days you realize what is the meaning of loneliness now a child who's lonely in a hostel let's take the example of a child who by nature is a loner now the child is put into an institution now can you imagine what will happen to that child because if there is not somebody who understands his problem and tries to integrate him or her with the other children that lonesome child will not only become a lonely child it probably become a child who will who will finally come in conflict with law or with himself you know and the personality will be totally warped what about the uh, uh, i think you know social workers the people in these institutions that you've seen even in the well run ones uh, what is the scenario in india is more training needed as you said you know it, it takes a professional i think to integrate a child properly now uh, is more training needed uh, is there adequate training in the first place or by and large are institutions the well run ones i should say are they doing a good job of integrating the children see there are some very good institutions and i am talking right now of very good institutions we'll talk about the bad ones also i don't want to leave them out the what happens is in india the system is they run more on less by social workers some by government sons there are some government institutions which are very well run i can tell you in tripura uh, the homes were very very well run when i was chief justice there and it was not because of me it was because of the people run it was see they had some very good ideas and i talk about those ideas also they had people with empathy for children managing them but what we have raised is a very important issue about training i think even the well run institutions have well meaning people handling the institutions they are they have all good intentions but they don't have the training see india woefully lacks psychological counselors even in general if you and i had to go find a counselor we would find it difficult to find a counselor you know and then we have this sort of a you know we feel that by if you go to a psychiatrist to pagal hi hoga jo if you go to a psychiatrist you see we have this inhibition mental inhibition that we will not go to psychiatrist so that i think is where we have to change a mindset we have to have involve more counselors people may be well meaning but they're not well trained we need to make social work a profession a well paid profession where people are paid well they are taken care of so that they don't have to worry about their own children now what happens is we have some fantastic i this is my experience in himachal and tripura which are good states that we had some fantastic teachers working at me 3000 4000 5000 rupees a month a pittance because they are on contract or something with the government and they're just waiting for the day when they will be recognized and they get into a salary and the minute they'll do that they'll go into some other uh, pro- proper school etc so this is where we have to make it into a profession we need to have a large amount of training you will be surprised to know that as far as child psychiatry is concerned as far as i know 
there is only one dedicated child psychiatry institution in the country in Bangalore. Other is the department may have a child psychiatry wing, but there, even the best of medical colleges don't have a separate department of child psychology. So almost 40% of our children, uh, population, which is below the age of 18, maybe you'll correct me, I, you, I may, maybe more than 40, they don't have any dedicated child psychologist. psychologist for them. In, and children in homes need psychologists more than children in natural homes. Yes. Now, in terms of let's get to alternative care. Uh, would you be able to perhaps define that as well so that our audience is uh, uh, just for our audience? What is it and uh, what the lay of the land is in India, what the current scenario is? See, alternative care is uh, sort of uh, in the act, there is no definition. But the act says there should be alternative. But I'll tell you what is alternative care. The first is kinship care. First, or first, I would put it in the family. Now, supposing a child has been abandoned by the mother because she can't afford to raise the child, not because she does not love the child, but because she can't afford to raise the child. Now, my argument with the government always has been: you pay an institution two thousand or three thousand rupees a month to bring up that child. Why can't you pay that mother fifteen hundred a month that you keep the child? We'll pay you fifteen hundred a month for bringing up this child. Obviously, this will have to be monitored. So one is that the child grows up in the family itself. If we have counselors, we can also see that a lot of this abuse does not take place. You see, a lot of children are abandoned when there is abuse of the mother. She feels frustrated and leaves the children. So some we have to deal that way. Then supposing now I'll come to the question where the child has to be given outside. What is the alternative? First is kinship care. Either in the family, that means in the family environment. I hope you understood me that supposing the mother or the father have died or they want to abandon the child, then somebody in the family, if the grandparents are not very old and they can look after the child, if there is an uncle or an aunt or somebody else who can look after the child, ko chacha, taya, bua, mama, mami, unme se koi bhi hai bache ka, unko request kiya ja sakta hai, ki aap bache ko rakho. I know people have expressed a doubt that sometimes the children are ill-treated. Sometimes the children are almost like domestic servants. But then that monitoring has to be done by the state. And some incentive has to be given to the parents, the, uh, uh, the adoptive parents, that we will pay you 1,000 rupees, 1,500 rupees a month. Because the government is paying up to 3,000 a child in institutions. The state government and the union government combined Pay in some in some state it goes up to five thousand a child, so even a fraction of that, because alternative care in my view, proper alternative care is also more economical for the government. Then if the kinship care doesn't work, then I come to care in the village itself, village or the community. See in the village or the community, then you go to the tehsil, then you go to the district, then you go to the state. Don't that's literally the like the quote, it takes a village to raise a child. That's yeah. that's the first thing that came to mind. You see, you see what happens in a if a child is ill-treated in a small village, there'll be somebody who will go to the Pradhan and complain that because this is what is you know, we are not bad people inherently. Inherently, Indian society is a good society where they old are also looked after we don't send our old people to old, old age homes and we just say. now the other aspect of is that when you send them to homes i have always advocated this that a child children home should be very clear close to an old age home because they sort of need each other and I have had the you know good fortune of seeing that at two stations the children home was placed next to an old age home. 
अब वो बच्चे सवेरे जाते हैं सम ओल्ड दादाजी नाना जी दे स्टार्ट कॉलिंग देम लाइक दैट मतलब यू नो हेल्प देम विद देयर टूथपेस्ट टूथब्रश देयर ओल्ड पेपर टेक देम टू द बाथरूम एंड ऑल एंड देन दे गो बैक टू स्कूल और टू स्टडी एटसेट्रा इन द इवनिंग द ओल्ड पीपल कम टू देयर होम एंड टेल देम स्टोरीज फ्रॉम द महाभारत रामायण सम ओल्ड स्टोरीज ऑफ द लोकल एरिया सो देयर इज अ बॉन्डिंग एंड दैट बॉन्डिंग लीड्स टू एन अफेक्शन इन बिटवीन देम द ओनली drawback is that sometimes there are cases of sexual abuse etc by these corona people so that has to be taken care of otherwise it's a very it's it is a system where there is you don't need employed persons these people themselves look after each other one other aspect which i'd like to highlight is that when we talk of this alternative care it has to be monitored very well so the monitoring has to be done very well now for the i don't know if you are aware that for the homes we developed a very big system it's not fully implemented but we developed a very big system a computer system of what is the health of the child of every child that can be done for this also yeah in now when we talk about uh, you know the first thing that comes to mind is uh, i was very briefly a, a law student Uh, okay. but uh, many many of my friends were uh, uh, have become lawyers and um, or are becoming lawyers or are in law school and i'm sure some of our audience members are also uh, either lawyers prospective lawyers uh, people interested in getting into the practice study of law as you said before social work should be a profession and that to a well paid profession now from what you've told me so far it seems that there is a big demand to kind of uh, uh, get into this field of uh, children's rights and uh, helping these children because a lot of problems uh, not just major problems of institutionalization and alternative practices but as you just said uh, there are problems of sexual abuse there are a hundred different things actually that you have to look into what can lawyers do to uh, or aspiring lawyers or uh, aspiring judges what can they do to get more involved in uh, protecting children's rights i think it's not only, I, i you know in fact uh, law students and young lawyers have played a very vital role in helping the improve, help improve the standards of the children i have always found you see there is an idealism in youth which is always present till it turns into cynicism when you reach middle age or above some of us like me have not li- lost our idealism even at the age of 65 but a lot of people become cynical i don't because i still have faith in humanity i have faith in the goodness of human beings and i expect a lot from uh, society you see to expect the government or the commission or everything to move uh, to answer all this is not uh, sufficient each one of us has to respond i gave you the example of some uh, eye surgeon giving all that uh, material to the home it just you know people logo no, people have this feeling that if i give the money will it be used properly will it go to the right people if you can give them the confidence that it will go to the right people so when young law students good law students young judges young lawyers take this as their task that we are going to help them i think it sends a very good message in society they have i am what law students i would say every type of student you see i don't know if you know that when we were when i was young and we were in college we either had to join ncc or nss so one was the national cadet corps or one was the national social service corps i think nss has just vanished now so you we need to have social service as a part of life each one of us who has been blessed to have a better standard of living owes it to the those of our brethren who are not so well off to do something maybe din mein 15 minute half an hour of our time spend to see discuss to see them now i'll tell you when you talk because your question also talked about sex abuse you are all aware i think about the famous infamous rather notorious muzaffarpur case where more than i mean so many young girls were sexually abused what is for me shocking is that a five story building came up four story it had no windows imagine four stories had no windows the fifth story only had ventilators roshandan jisko bolte 
it had no windows and this building was housing the children home now each one of us as a citizen whether it was my district judge whether it was the chairperson of the legal services authority whether it was the district magistrate whether it was the sdm whether it was a principal of a college whether it was a lawyer whether it was a doctor crossing that building did not anybody realize how can a children home be run behind a prison like this and what is happening behind these huge walls which don't have a window in it? it is when society becomes apathetic when it loses it becomes insensitive that occurrences like that are and therefore it is not only students all of us need to see take a little time spend a little time looking at the things of the now you mentioned uh, you made a small mention of prison so i I'd, i'd like to just insert uh, one question now when we're talking about uh, in india at least i worked a little bit in the us with uh, minors going to uh, uh, ju- juvie we called it juvie but juvenile detention centers uh, in the united states uh, when we talk about minors over here uh that have uh, that have been involved perhaps in criminal activity or um, uh illegal activities uh what can be said about alternative care practices for them unfortunately not much all that is done is to put them in homes and these homes are by and large barring a few they are very badly done they are uh, overcrowded and uh, my experience is that even if a minor with uh, very small issues or problems is sent to such a home by the time he leaves the home he is either been abused sexually or otherwise physically or he has himself become a perpetrator of that sort of offense because therefore i am very liberal while granting bail to these uh, juveniles even if they commit serious offenses because the way we run our homes is pathetic i mean especially these homes homes for what we call i think shelter homes for children in conflict with law now these homes by and large are not run well at all and you see we do the act and we say this that these juveniles will not be treated to be criminals but in fact when they go in behind those bars they are treated like criminals it may be true that they come out after 3 years but uh, well they're not it's as bad as a prison maybe worse sometimes so what is the solution for this uh, in terms of alternative care for uh, no, juvenile no, no, i would say delinquents no, is sorry, there uh, what is what's the solution i, I have not uh, i don't think there's a uh, cure for uh, there is an alternative care for juveniles in conflict with law you can't put them in alternative care at this stage as per the act maybe at a later stage sometime we may be able to do it right now one can only give bail and send them to the parents hoping that they'll do the best alternative care for and i am not ready to be honest not examined it from that aspect in aspect of juveniles in conflict with law so i'll not answer the question today maybe sometime else okay now when we talk about let's go back to alternative care for uh, children right uh, i guess for orphans those have been who have been abandoned uh, now what are some of the uh, you as a judge when you served uh, what are some of the things you've seen i'm sure that is one question that our audience would like to know um, in terms of what has happened to these children after uh, where have they gone what needs to be done i know this is a very loaded question but these are the questions that i'm getting on live stream uh what what in your experience uh, i don't want to use the word solution again but what is the best way to go about when these children get out of institutions uh as you said there are psychological problems involved uh possibly uh they deal with uh, uh problems in terms of uh, sexual misconduct while they are in these institutions they could face it but by and large uh, do you feel that they they come out of these institutions uh, ready to become contributing members of society or is more work needed to be done much more work is needed to be done see we have no this act also does not contemplate anything of aftercare 
after care when they leave the institution. We drop them like hot potatoes the minute they turn 18. Happy birthday, you've turned 18, get out of the home, fend for yourself. That is not the answer. Unfortunately, majority of the institutions do that. But luckily, in the last four or five years, under the leadership of Justice Madan Lokur, who was heading the Juvenile Justice Committee before me, and with the help of UNICEF and the Child Protection Committees and the Child Rights Commissions of the States and the National Commission, we've been working together in roundtable conferences. And uh, I can say with a sense of satisfaction, uh, not satisfaction, with a sense, I mean, not total satisfaction, with a partial satisfaction, I put it, that there are some states which have now got into, you know, uh, in programs, some institutions, like with, say, hospitality industry, or somebody who comes and gives training to them while they're in the institution, then, you know, you need to do, do hand-holding for the children for a year or so. You can't leave those children. Agar, if I have an 18-year-old daughter, even if she wants to become independent, after 15 days, if she wants to come back, she comes back. Here, the child is left. I, in Tripura, we had a situation where the boy had been brought up in the home. 18, I told you, it was a very well-run institution. The, he, was got, uh, he was managed to, you know, given a job and he could also get into evening college or something of uh, continuous education. But every night he'd come back to the home and tell the lady who was running the home that I'm going to sleep here. Mera to aur koi ghar so she asked me, what can I do? Because somebody complains and you call me that how are you letting a male adult live here after he's turned? I said, no, no, please let him live. Because he has no home. You see, for him, that is the only family he was knowing. And for him, to, for that child to be put up in the... So we need we need a lot of tremendous... I know they, here I, I'll digress a little because I see we've done 42 minutes. I want to talk about 5-10 minutes of my experience in Romania. Please. Because I, think, because I think we need to learn from Romania. It's one of the leaders in the world as far as alternative care is concerned. And I, before I do that, I must mention there are two other types of children who are abandoned. Those with physical disabilities and those with mental, who are mentally challenged. Parents abandon them also. Now, for them, a different. There, there, in India, aftercare for them is almost impossible. They have to be institutionalized. Now, and to me, you know, I about two years back we had a conference in Delhi, and I heard Dalia Pop. She's the head of an uh, institution called Hopes and Homes in Romania, and uh, she talked about deinstitutionalization, and she invited us about. A six, seven member delegation went. I was leading the delegation. Now, Romania under Kochescu, when who was the last communist leader, you see, they believed that children belong to the state, not to the parents. And there were more in a, in, a, in Romania, there were more than 250,000 kids in institutions. And I happened to see some of these institutions. Though, according to the Romanian, these were very bad institutions. By Indian standards, the buildings were of very high quality. Our Indian institutions don't have such good institutions, uh, such good buildings. I'm not talking about the care, etc. But because we only saw the, because they had kept it as a reminder of the cruel days. And when I saw the building, I said, you talk of cruel days, this building is better than most of our buildings. When they took over, and the main issue was love and affection. Today in Romania, there are only 6,000 children in institutions. From 2,50,000, it is only 6,000. But there are two, three big reasons. The people looking after child care, whether in the ministry, whether in the administration, whether in the political field, are the same people for the last 15 to 20 years. Everybody I met said, I've been working in this line for the last 20 years. Because they are professionals. They are paid very well. 
Now, what happens there is that when you register as foster care parents, and Romania, is a, mind you, is a, one of the poorest European countries. It's not a rich country. Probably in economic terms, it's as, I mean, like India, it may or maybe slightly better of us. I'm not talk, comparing us with US or because the, you know, you can't compare, you don't have. But whenever somebody comes in as a foster parents, that couple is given 500 euros a month. Now that is a lot of money. And then for each child, three, I don't know, don't remember the exact figure, but three or 400 for each child kept. So 500 plus 300, if one child is managed by them. If they manage two children, then 1100. Now they have a limit. They interview the people. They see, I, I have seen physically challenged children in these homes because the parents already had one physically challenged child. They said, we'll get another one physically challenged child so both can be friends and this. So that was one. The other very good example was, where do you live, Priyanka? In Delhi? You live in Delhi? I'm in South, South Delhi. South Delhi. So let's say uh, we went to a area in, uh, we, we, it was a small town called Bayamare. So let's say South Delhi, I don't know whether you're living in Defcall or somewhere, wherever you're living. We go into one of these middle class colonies. There's a house. It doesn't have any board saying anything inside. There's no board saying it's a children's home or anything. It's just like number C152 or C153. We walk in and it's a home with three bedrooms or four bedrooms. One bedroom for the two caregivers and three bedrooms with three of three, three children or four, four children. So there were about 10, 11 children with two caregivers living in a three bedroom house with a drawing room, a dining room, cooking their own meals, you know, helping each other, living like a family does. So even the institutions are not large institutions. Then the institutions have become homes. And that is a true home. So that is how they met. And there also, amongst the 12 children, there'll be one slightly, not a very, a slightly disabled child or a slightly mentally challenged child. So that the other children grow up with each. They go to the same local school where the, all the children go. You know, you've been in the US, the children go to, account to the, not account to the fee your parents can go pay, but account to the school which is closest to you. So they go to the school which is closest to them. They play with those children, come back, do their homework, whatever. They don't get much homework on like India, but uh, they do whatever they have to do. And that is the sort of homes which we have to do. These huge institutions will never give, give children love and affection. You know, even it's not that in India this has not happened. All of us know of the SOS villages where, uh, uh, where these mother, there used to be one mother with four and five children in a house. So you see, if you have one mother, four and five children, this mother will have affection for the children, the children will have affection for them. But if you have 100 people in a children in an institution, even if you put 25 adults to look after it. The other thing is, <coughs> I'm so sorry. The other thing is, and I have this complaint both against the Child Rights Committee since I'm talking about the state. I received a complaint from a lady who runs a very good institution that she was hauled up because one of her 14 year old children, children in an institution was taking clothes out of a washing machine. So they said, You're making a wash clothes. Now that's ridiculous. We have to be more realistic. Our children do it and they must do it and learn how to use a washing machine, how to use. So, this is where we take things to a very extreme end. The idea is that they should live like normal children. They should not be classified as children who belong to some different sort of a criteria and they have some different. The attempt should be, and this is where the act fails a little bit. The act makes it very regimented. You can't have a regimentation. Children can't be regimented. Each child has his own, uh, I mean, life in front of the child. Each child, somebody may be good at painting, somebody may be good at sports. Those uh, talents of a child need to be recognized at every level. Now, there's one very interesting question. Uh, this is coming from a person who's watching. 
Uh, this question is coming from uh, Harshita, and I want to thank her for this question. So, Harshita, thanks for watching the show. But the question is, uh, what can be done in these uh, mm -hmm. large? We were just talking about this. What can be done in these large institutions or institutions as such uh, to substitute for love and emotion that the child gets from parents? Is as you said before, is foster care the answer? Or is there any way to kind of substitute it, any way that this love and affection can be implemented in large institutions? Because that is what the current scenario is, unfortunately. Arshita, that's a very, very actually valid question. And uh, I also know that you can't, you know, much as I would like to, we can't take, we can only begin with after alternative care at the present. We'll, at the very, you know, this idea is just taking growth. It's just at the seed level. There's hardly very few children. But I can tell you when we went back to from Romania, uh, one of our judges, Justice Tadok Chuan, was from Himachal. And Himachal today has more children in foster care in one and a half years that has been achieved than children in institutions. So when you put your mind to it, it can be done. Now, to give children love and affection in uh, very large institutions, in my view, is very, very difficult. It's not impossible. But it is very, very difficult. I mean, we all know it. Those of us who have studied, when when I studied, a class used to be 20 or 25 kids. The teacher would know every kid. When my daughter joined school, it was 40 to 45 kids. Now it is 50, 60. The relationship between, it's humanly possible for the teacher to not, to have a relationship with 60 kids. So we need to have more people like Harshita, or Priyanka or anybody else visiting these institutions and connecting with, you know, sort of, I'm not saying adopting in the sense of adopting some children, but adopting seven, eight kids. If you're a painter, take out the five, six children who love painting, give them a lesson of painting two times a week. They'll start confiding in you. They'll start telling you so many things. You know, this inspection which we have are a farce, they're a mockery. Everybody knows the inspection team are here and everything is painted up, brushed up and the children are told to answer. The real inspection is when you and I, ordinary people, go to these homes, sit and talk to the children. And I'm not saying that birthday you take a special meal once a year and say, okay, children, you're the beggars, now have a good birthday meal from because of my child's birthday. And uh, that's something. No. Don't give them that extra food or anything, but give them that little time to talk to, that little empathy, that little compassion that they can relate to you. That is more important than just dropping a, a couple of lakhs in any institution. Great. There's one more question. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, what is the impact of, uh, do you have any advice? I think I can group these questions because they're coming in. Uh, multiple questions are coming in, but they're asking the same thing. In terms of COVID-19, especially for young lawyers, uh, what is the impact on the judiciary system going ahead? What do you see? You know, this is with regard to children or with regard to lawyers as a community? I think they are asking uh, with regard to lawyers, lawyers as, as a community. A community. <laughs> see, I, I know I can understand young lawyers. They're also children as far as I am concerned. The, uh, see, it's a very difficult time. It's a difficult time for everybody. But for those who have just started the profession and those who have no, you see, there are some of us who are lucky who either parents are lawyers or parents can support you for some time. It's very easy. But imagine a young lawyer who's done his law from Delhi University, has studying in, come from Odisha, parents can't afford to support him or her any longer, and you have no earning. It's a very difficult situation. The landlord wants rent both for the office and the home. And uh, I know a lot of companies are giving pay cuts, etc. But we can only hope that the situation will improve. Because now with the opening up, you must get used to giving more advice on the net. You must get used to doing doing a lot of work on the net. You know, I am not going to that big question of court hearings, virtual hearings, because in my view, they can, they can only have a limited use and not, they cannot become a permanent tool. But they can be used uh, not only now, but even later for some purposes and shorten the uh, court process. But for young lawyers, also use this time to read up the law. 
also use this time to do other things which you would have wanted to do, but because you are working in some firms which make you work till four in the morning and you couldn't do those, take time off for yourself, relax a bit. I know it's not easy to relax all the time, but relax a bit and see if you can help others during this time. You know, help others even by organizing a webinar or something, by seeing there's an order which I passed with regard to COVID, what action should be taken in these homes during COVID times. That was one of the last orders which I passed sometime in April before my retirement. If some of you would like to help, look into that order. See how whether that order is being implemented in your state or not. And bring that matter before the court. That so this is not happening or this is not happening. But before you bring it to court, Deal it with the state authorities, etc. So I'm trying to combine both this and the lawyer's problem and the topic of today. That you have you have the time now to do things to help others also. Yeah. And uh, so I think we just have four, four, a little under four minutes left. But yeah. last question, which is a good one. Uh, first of all, uh, we said it a little bit in the beginning, but congratulations on your recent retirement. And uh, you were one of the, the question is, you were one of the first judges to receive a virtual farewell. How did that yeah. feel? It feels quite nice, you know. Uh, I mean, obviously, one was looking forward for a, uh, a real farewell. Because what in COVID is missing is the touch. You know, I love to shake hands with people. With good friends, give a hug. Now that you can't do even at home. So leave aside in real times. But, uh, well, this is a first which I'll uh, cherish. It had its own advantages. One of the advantages was that it was live streamed everywhere. So I could not only say uh, a goodbye to my friend in the Supreme Court bar and the Supreme Court, but also to my friends in Himachal, Tripura and Chhattisgarh, which would not have happened in an actual favor. I also have, I was also the first chief justice of the Tripura High Court, so I take this as this first as part of my journey as a human being. Well, thank you so much, Justice Gupta, for your time. Uh, thank you for spending so much time with us. I think we we've, we've spent uh, one hour. The last right. question okay. that I have for you is: there uh, is there anything that perhaps I haven't asked you, the audience hasn't asked you, that uh, you'd like to say? Any questions? No. See, I'll only say what is needed is sensitivity. You may have the best of learning. You have the best of ideas. You may be, you know, you may be a child psychologist. You may be a doctor. But unless you're sensitive to the needs of the children, even for judges, even for lawyers, you must, I always tell judges who handle these cases, that don't sit on a dais. Because that atmosphere intimidates the child. Sit on the, I mean, I mean, so what? You can sit on the ground, sit on a sofa, sit on an ordinary chair like the child does, so that the child has confidence. Child thinks that he, the child, can trust. You. And once you gain the child's trust, then everything works. Especially when you deal with custody matters, children in battles, parents' custody. I find that the children suffer most because in the battle of egos between the warring husband and wife, the child is made a scapegoat. So to, you must be sensitive to the needs and if you're sensitive, then half the things work out. Great. And that's a great way to end it. That's so important. But uh, as I said before, Justice Gupta, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining NCPCR's webinar. And uh, just truly wanted to thank you because it was a very insightful discussion. Uh, I think we covered a lot of topics very quickly that perhaps needed a little deeper discussion. But I'm glad that we could touch upon them because I think by and large, the public is uh, not so well versed and not so aware of, of these issues. Now, we are paying so much attention to COVID and the economy and this and that. But we're not paying attention to children and uh, institutions and, and things like that. So I, I just wanted to thank you because this is such an important topic. Thank you for having me over. I really enjoyed this yeah. session. Thank you. Thank yep. you very much.
And uh, please leave some questions on the Facebook live stream. Uh, I'm sure Justice Gupta would like to take a look at them if we couldn't get to them. Uh, for, with that being said, thanks for watching NCPCR session. Uh, this is Priyanka Deo signing off. Till next time. Thank you.